Welcome back to this next video in which we are studying headaches. Okay, so we've now finished our discussion of the pathophysiology of tension type headaches, or at least what we believe is the pathophysiology of tension type headaches, uh, and we're now going to move on to discussing the treatments for tension type headaches. So let's come over here and discuss treatments. So let me get uh, a nice colored pen and I'll just put this as the title. So we're now going to discuss the treatment for tension type headaches. So when we're discussing the treatment for tension type headaches, and indeed when we're discussing the uh, treatment of loads of the different types of headaches, that we, as we will do uh, as we progress through this video, uh, we will be splitting treatment into two categories. And those two categories are abortive treatment, which means treatment to abort a headache or end a headache when you're actually suffering from it. So if you actually have a tension type headache right now and you want to take something that will get rid of that headache, will relieve that treatment, sorry, will relieve that headache, uh, that is called an abortive treatment. So we'll go over abortive treatments and then the other type of treatment is the preventative treatments. And the fancy name for treatment that is given to prevent something uh, is prophylactic treatment. So the other category is prophylactic treatment, which is treatment given to actually prevent you suffering from tension type headaches. Now, of course, most people are not on prophylactic treatment for tension type headaches. If you just suffer from the occasional tension type headache, you do not need to be on prophylactic treatment for tension type headaches. However, people who are suffering from very frequent tension type headaches uh, to the point that it's going into chronic tension type headaches, they will be um, they will seek medical attention for the tension type headaches and they will be potentially offered prophylactic treatment. And the prophylactic treatment is usually aimed at getting rid of the trigger and the trigger in very frequent tension type headaches is usually emotional stress and therefore the prophylactic treatments are antidepressant medications. Uh, to which reduce emotional stress and nervousness as well as making you happier. Okay, so let's start by discussing the abortive treatment. So Hopefully this is common knowledge because we've all had tension type headaches before and when they're very mild, of course, you just endure. Uh, but if they go up into the moderate um, regions of pain, if they become a little bit more severe, such as the headache that can accompany really bad flu episodes, then you may well uh, think about actually taking an abortive treatment. And the treatments that we take are NZs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and uh, paracetamol, also called uh, acetaminophen in the United States. Okay, so uh, let me write these down then. So the abortive treatments, one category is the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, abbreviated down to NZs. So let me um, give you some examples then of these. So EG. Uh, so, how many of these can you name? Of course, there are the two absolutely incredibly famous ones that um, lots of people will have taken before in their lives. Aspirin and ibuprofen are two very famous uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Some less famous ones, but nevertheless notable examples are indomethacin, spelt like so, indomethacin, and something to know about the name indomethacin, some people drop the H and just call it indomethacin. Uh, so if you see someone talking about indomethacin, or hear someone rather talking about indomethacin, that's the same thing as indomethacin. Other notable examples of NSAIDs, diclofenac, oops, nearly spelled that wrong, diclofenac is an example, and another example, naproxen. And all of these drugs are believed to work in the same way, and they're all very effective um, for aborting a tension-type headache. Uh, the other drug is paracetamol that's frequently used to abort tension-type headaches. And to be honest, this is the one I'd recommend that you use to abort tension-type headaches. It has usually fewer side effects than the NZs. It doesn't carry the same risk of gastric bleeding, which the NZs do. So paracetamol, and paracetamol in the United States is called acetaminophen. And I apologise for this video, it is going to be a bit listy. We're going to list off a huge long, uh, I mean these are not the only lists of drugs we're going to do, we're going to be listing off some more um, names of drugs later on. So there are going to be quite a few lists here. Okay, let's spice it up now by having a look at the mechanism, which is obviously far more interesting than the names. 
So, let's start by having a look at the mechanism of the NZs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. How do we think that these abort attention type headache? Well, in fact, all of these, not just the NZs, paracetamol as well, we believe that they work by stopping the production of prostaglandin E2. And indeed, when you have attention type headache as a systemic symptom of inflammation, this is also the reason that these are effective at stopping the muscle aches as well because remember the muscle aches in the rest of the body uh, in the legs and the arms they're also triggered by the same mechanism the inflammatory mediators in the blood triggering the production of prostaglandin E2 in these far off muscle tissues uh, and if we can block the production of prostaglandin E2 we won't just get rid of the tension type headache but we'll also get rid of the muscle aches so be aware of that also. So we think these drugs work to abort attention type headache by stopping the production of prostaglandin E2. So let me just write a little bit of this down. So all of these, we think they're all going to work by inhibiting the production of prostaglandin E2. So I've just put one of those inhibiting symbols here and then prostaglandin E2. Uh, now, if we stopped the production of prostaglandin E2, why would that then effectively abort attention type headache? Well, remember, it's the prostaglandin E2 that is activating the nociceptors in the uh, frontalis, temporalis, and occipitalis muscle tissues. Uh, so, if we stop producing more prostaglandin E2 by taking this drug, then of course we'll just have to wait for the prostaglandin E2 that's already in the muscle tissue, that's already been produced, to be broken down. That will occur reasonably quickly. Uh, and then there won't be any more being produced because of the drugs, or at least there'll be very little now being produced because you've taken the drug. Um, and therefore, the headache will go away. Once the prostaglandin E2 has gone, the nociceptors will no longer be being activated, they'll no longer be firing, and therefore you'll no longer uh, be getting this information relayed up to the primary somatosensory cortexes, and you will uh, be relieved of the pain. So, that's how we believe these drugs work, by blocking the production of prostaglandin E2. And we're going to go further. How, then, do these drugs block the production of prostaglandin E2? Well, this is a very famous mechanism, of course. They block the cyclooxygenase enzymes. Now, what do the cyclooxygenase enzymes do? Well, they're important in the synthesis of prostaglandins. So, let me remind you about the synthesis of prostaglandins. So, all prostaglandins, and there are loads more prostaglandins than just prostaglandin E2, all of them are produced from the starting molecule, arachidonic acid, which we can abbreviate down to capital A, capital A. Okay, this is the starting molecule. Now, arachidonic acid is a long-chain carboxylic acid. It's a fatty acid, and it is one of the fatty acids that quite frequently is in phospholipids. So remember the phospholipids of cell membranes, they are usually, they usually are, um, they usually consist of a glycerol molecule with a phosphate group attached to one of its alcohol groups and then two uh, long chain carboxylic acids attached to the other alcohol groups. And in some of the phospholipids, in the phospholipid by there, the long chain carboxylic acids that you'll have in your phospholipids will be arachidonic acid molecules. So you can get a lot of arachidonic acid by breaking down phospholipids in the cell membrane. So that's where arachidonic acid comes from. Uh, once we've got the arachidonic acid free of the phospholipids then, we can, can use it to make uh, prostaglandins. So what happens next? So next up, to make prostaglandins, it needs to be acted upon by an enzyme called a cyclooxygenase enzyme. And this cyclooxygenase enzyme firstly converts it into prostaglandin G2, so PGG2, and then will convert it further into prostaglandin H2. So both of these reactions that I've drawn here are going to be catalyzed by enzymes called cyclooxygenase enzymes, which for short are often abbreviated to the COX enzymes. So cyclooxygenase enzymes catalyze these reactions. And for short, cyclooxygenase enzymes are often abbreviated down to COX enzymes. C for cyclo, OX for oxygen. Oh, well, oxygenase. Now, there are two major types of COX enzymes. There is COX-1 and there is COX-2. Those are the major two cyclooxygenase enzymes. So, 
To make prostaglandins then, we start off with arachidonic acid, which we've got from phospholipids. We then put it through these two reactions that are catalyzed by the cyclooxygenase enzymes, COX-1 and COX-2. We convert it firstly into prostaglandin G2, and we then convert it into prostaglandin H2. And let me just stress that both COX-1 and COX-2 can catalyze both of these steps. It's not like COX-1 catalyzes this one and COX-2 catalyzes this one. No, COX-1 can catalyze this one and this one. COX-2 can catalyze this one and this one. They're two enzymes that both do the same thing. Okay, now these reactions are so important that they even have their own fancy names. Uh, so the first reaction, this is known as the cyclooxygenase reaction. So the conversion of arachidonic acid into prostaglandin G2, that's called the cyclooxygenase reaction. And then the second reaction where we are converting prostaglandin G2 into prostaglandin H2 that's known as the peroxidase reaction. So both the cyclooxygenase and the peroxidase reactions are catalyzed by cyclooxygenase 1 and 2. Now, once we have formed prostaglandin H2, we can then convert that into loads of other prostaglandins uh, by the action of other enzymes. And one of the prostaglandins that we can convert it into is prostaglandin E2. Uh, and there will be enzymes that catalyze the conversion of prostaglandin H2 into prostaglandin E2. However, recognize that this can become loads of other types of prostaglandins as well. This is just one of the ones that is very important in inflammatory pain. Okay, so the NZs, aspirin, ibuprofen, indomethacin, diclofenac, and naproxen, they all work, all of these five drugs here, all of them work, by inhibiting the cyclooxygenase enzymes, and they inhibit both of them, cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2, and they therefore block the production of prostaglandins all over the body, and that's why these produce quite a lot of side effects, well they can produce quite a lot of side effects, because you don't just block the production of prostaglandin E2, which is the one you want to stop the production of, you also block the production of loads of other prostaglandins, which is why they can lead to things like gastric bleeding if you take too much of them. Okay, so you do have to be careful uh, with the NZs. But this is the way that they're going to block the production of prostaglandin E2. If you can't convert arachidonic acid into prostaglandin H2 anymore, then you can't produce prostaglandin E2 from that. So this is the way that you abort the production of prostaglandin E2 in uh, the frontalis, temporalis, and occipitalis muscles, and hence how NZs are going to abort uh, tension-type headaches. On to paracetamol or acetaminophen. This is a drug, a wonderful drug, very well tolerated. Unless you overdose on it, this drug will not generally cause you any harm. It doesn't cause gastric bleeding like the other NZs. Now, even though it's a fantastic drug which we use all the time, and it's, you know, the drug I would advise that if you want relief from a tension type headache, don't take aspirin or ibuprofen. Uh, they may be stronger, but they carry risks. Take paracetamol. Even though this is such a fantastic drug, we don't actually really know how it works. It's still very, very controversial how paracetamol works. Or we think, because it shares so many similarities with the NZs, that it probably stops the production of prostaglandin E2 as well. So we looked for a mechanism by which it could do this. And it does not block cyclooxygenase 1 and 2. Paracetamol does not block these two. However, when we were searching for a mechanism for how paracetamol could work, we found another cyclooxygenase enzyme. We found a third one. We found COX-3. And this one was blocked by paracetamol. And this looked brilliant. It looked as though we had worked it out. There was a third cyclooxygenase enzyme, COX-3. Paracetamol, we found that it blocked COX-3. Therefore, this could be the way that paracetamol reduced the production of prostaglandin E2 and therefore could abort tension type headaches and muscle aches in flu and other uh, systemic symptoms of inflammation. However, it's still controversial whether this is the way that paracetamol works. You see, the problem is this enzyme, COX-3, we don't actually think it's present in the right tissues. So for instance, with regards to tension type headaches, we don't think it's actually present in the temporalis muscles and the frontalis muscles and the occipitalis muscles. In fact, 
COX-3, you can find it in certain regions of the brain, uh, but we can't really find it in peripheral tissues. So that kind of stamps this out potentially as a mechanism, because if it's going to block the production of prostaglandin E2 by blocking COX-3 in the peripheral tissues, then COX-3 must be important in those peripheral muscle tissues, but we haven't yet found it convincingly in those tissues. So this is why it's still controversial how paracetamol or acetaminophen works. If you want a simple answer, rub this question mark out and say COX-3 is in those muscle tissues, paracetamol blocks it, hence it blocks the production of prostaglandin E2. However, that is only a theory and it's not looking particularly hopeful that that theory is actually going to turn out to be right. However, it would be lovely if that was the simple explanation for how paracetamol slash acetaminophen works, but it may not be. Okay, but we overall still hypothesize that paracetamol probably blocks the production of prostaglandin E2 like the other NZs, and it remains a fact that it is a fantastic drug for aborting tension type headaches. Right, so there are the abortive medications, usually stronger abortive medications such as the triptan drugs are not used in tension type headaches. They're used in worse types of headaches such as migraines. We'll see how they work later so I'm not going to talk about them in this section. So let's now move on to the other category of treatments. So let's get another colour. We'll have mustard yellow. Now underline it. We're now going to talk about prophylactic treatments. So the prophylactic treatments are going to be the antidepressant medications. So again, let me justify why we are prescribing antidepressants. You might say, well, these people don't have a problem with depression necessarily. Why are you prescribing antidepressant medications? Antidepressant medications are used not just for depression. They are also used for a huge number of anxiety disorders, such as generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, they don't just make you happier, they don't just treat depression, they also make you less nervous and they make you less stressed. So antidepressants are very good um, drugs at reducing emotional stress. So remember, antidepressants do not just make you happier, we think they make you less nervous and they make you less emotionally stressed. And of course, if we can reduce your emotional stress, then hopefully we can reduce how many tension type headaches you are experiencing. I'll remind you that we only hand prophylactic medications out for tension type headaches if they are very frequent. Um, and we would only give these drugs if we're convinced that the trigger for them is uh, the emotional stress, i.e. psychological reasons, rather than, uh, for instance, because you've got some disease that is causing chronic inflammation somewhere. Okay, of course, if you had some disease that was causing chronic inflammation somewhere, the treatment would not be antidepressants. It would be treating whatever that disease is that's causing that chronic inflammation. Okay, so let's discuss how we believe antidepressant medications work. So there are lots of different types of antidepressant medications. The three major types are the SSRIs, the Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors, the SNRIs, the serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, and then the TCAs, the tricyclic antidepressants, and all of these can be prescribed as prophylactic medications for tension type headaches. So the question now is, how do these drugs work? So again, the mechanism is controversial, and it's very, very controversial. A lot of people are very, very interested in what is the cause of depression, and obviously when you're trying to fathom um, what is the cause of a disease, one of the very helpful things to look at is do we know anything about how the drugs work? So the mechanism of these drugs is very, very studied, and therefore there's a lot of heated controversy about how it works. I am going to tell you one of the major theories of how antidepressants work. You will probably have heard of it before. It's the monoamine hypothesis, or you've heard it before, um, so I will be reminding you. So, the monoamine hypothesis is a very uh, respected, very old, very respected standard textbook explanation of how antidepressants might work. There are more modern explanations which might uh, overtake this explanation, but it still remains one of the major theories of how antidepressants work, and clinicians often talk about it. 
So I will uh, tell you about the monoamine hypothesis. So the monoamine hypothesis is that all these types of antidepressants work by increasing the amount of monoamines uh, in the central nervous system. Now there are two major monoamines that these are going to target, which are 5-hydroxytryptamine, or 5-HT, which is the fancy name, of course, for serotonin. So that's a monoamine neurotransmitter. And of course, monoamine just means that the molecule has a single amino group in. And let me just write out the full name for 5-HT. So it is 5-hydroxytryptamine is the full name for that. Okay, that's one of the major monoamines, and that's the famous one that is associated with depression. Lots of people in the world know, uh, would recognise the name serotonin and would be able to say that's something to do with depression, isn't it? Uh, so a very famous monoamine. The other less famous monoamine than serotonin is noradrenaline, but it's believed to be very important potentially as well. So noradrenaline. And I suppose I should probably give you the other name for noradrenaline. So in the States, noradrenaline is often called norepinephrine, which I think is spelt like that. Um, I will abbreviate noradrenaline down to N-A. If you are in the States, you can abbreviate it down to N-E, if you'd like. All right, so these are the two monoamines, 5-hydroxytryptamine and noradrenaline. Now, in the central nervous system, these can act as neurotransmitters. They are used as molecules to communicate between nerve cells. However, they are extremely rare neurotransmitters in the brain. Hardly any neurons in the brain use these neurotransmitters at all. The main neurotransmitters that are used are glutamate and GABA. Glutamate is the main in uh, sorry, I was about to say the exact opposite way round to which it is. Glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, and GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. These two are very, very rare neurotransmitters, and all of the neurons in the brain that use these as their neurotransmitter are concentrated in little nuclei that are in the brainstem. Now, they these neurons that have their cell bodies in these little nuclei in the brainstem, and of course I'm going to delight in showing you the anatomy of these nuclei in just a moment. Um, these neurons that have their cell bodies in these nuclei, they send their axons far, far away from the nucleus, so that from these nuclei you have axons going all over the brain. So, noradrenaline and serotonin are going all over the brain, and we believe that they have a different role to the neurotransmitters glutamate and GABA. Glutamate and GABA are all about activating action potentials. Serotonin and noradrenaline are not about that. They're about causing more long-term changes in the nerve cells. They're not about causing action potentials in that nerve cell. They're about changing the behavior of that nerve cell longer term than just, are you going to fire an action potential in the next second or not? Okay, and we believe that they have a modulatory role. They determine how the brain structure is changing. And remember, the brain structure is continuously changing. The way that your nerve cells are connected up to one another is continuously changing. And we believe that these monoamines, serotonin and noradrenaline, are important in modulating how the structure of your brain is going to change. So, all of these antidepressants, they are believed to work by changing the levels of these um, monoamines. SSRIs raise serotonin. SNRIs raise both serotonin and noradrenaline. Tricyclic antidepressants raise both serotonin and noradrenaline as well. So they all raise these monoamines. And we believe that by raising the monoamines, they trigger changes in the structure of the brain that then make you happier, make you less anxious, make you less emotionally stressed. I'm doing a very hard sell of these drugs. Someone has to. Right, um, so uh, that's the way we believe that these um, drugs work. That is the monoamine hypothesis. Now, we used to believe that actually the way, these, that the, way the monoamines worked was that they actually correlated to happiness itself, i.e. that higher levels of the monoamines made you happier and made you less nervous, made you less stressed, made you more confident. We don't think that anymore. The reason is that these drugs, antidepressant drugs, they, you have to take them for a few weeks, if not a few months, before you actually notice effects, before you actually feel happier, less stressed, less anxious. Um, 
more confidence, etc. Uh, whereas, as soon as you take the drug, within half an hour, the monoamine levels will have gone up. So it just didn't make sense. If it was the case that the levels of monoamines themselves correlated to your mood, which was our old thought, then you would expect your mood to improve um, as soon as you took the drug, or at least within half an hour of taking the drug. Whereas that doesn't happen, they take longer than that to work. So we think what happens now is that you raise the level of the monoamines, they change the structure of the brain somehow, because they play this modulatory role, and that changes in the structure of the brain then make you happier, less anxious, um, less uh, stressed. Of course, this is all very wishy-washy. I can't give you exact mechanisms because we don't know exact mechanisms. It's all very, and if this causes this arrow, that's it. That's all I can explain. Okay, so uh, what I can do for you is show you where the nuclei that contain the neurons uh, that uh, use these neurotransmitters are located in the brainstem. So we'll start with noradrenaline because noradrenaline is slightly simpler. So noradrenaline, there are two nuclei, one on either side of the brainstem, that are in the pons region of the brainstem that contain loads of neurons that all use noradrenaline as their neurotransmitter. And those are the only neurons in the entire brain that do use noradrenaline as their neurotransmitter. And these nuclei, these areas, are called the locus ceruleus, and I'm afraid it's spelt rather strangely. It's spelt locus ceruleus. It's got loads of, it's a very strange spelling, but it is pronounced locus ceruleus. And again, this is one of those places in neuroanatomy where there is no good plural. What am I supposed to do? Loci, cerulei? No, no one uses that. Locus ceruleus is the singular, but there are two of them. So let me now draw them on. So, back to our good old brainstem cross-sections. Ah, here we go. Here is the pons. And I won't do them in vivid purple. I'll do them in blue. So, where are the locus ceruleuses? That's probably the best plural I can come up with. They are right at the back of the pons, actually behind the reticular formation. And thankfully, I don't need to draw another cross-section because they are roughly at the middle level of the pons, at the level where the principal sensory nucleus of the trigeminal nerve is. So I can put them on this cross-section that we've got here. So here is one behind the reticular formation there, and here is the other. So I'll just label those up. Those are the uh, locus ceruleuses. So we've got a left locus ceruleus and a right uh, locus ceruleus. Okay, uh, so in those areas of the pons then, you have loads of cell bodies of neurons that use noradrenaline as their neurotransmitter and all of them send their axons all over the place. They all go to different places and are releasing noradrenaline into far, far off portions of the brain. So just to emphasize this, here is our picture of the brain. Locus ceruleus is down here somewhere, but it will have axons going all over the place from different neurons in its uh, mass. Into the cerebellum, down into the spinal cord, it is a major modulatory nucleus. And noradrenaline plays this very important modulatory role. Okay, so that's the locus ceruleus. Uh, let's now go back down here and let's now talk about serotonin. So serotonin is more complicated, there are loads of serotonin nuclei and collectively they all have a name, they're known as the raphi or raphe nuclei. So raphe, and I'm debating now whether the E has that French accent on it, I'm not going to put it, it may well have uh, a French acute, I think it's E acute, the thing going up like that, but I don't know. Uh, We'll just spell it like this. So, there are loads of nuclei in the brainstem known as the raphe nuclei uh, that are all serotonergic nuclei. They contain neurons which are using, uh, the, well, they're the cell bodies of the neurons that are using serotonin as their neurotransmitter. So there are loads of these. I'm not going to go through all of their names. Instead, what I'm going to do is tell you where they are all located. So, they're located in the reticular formation throughout the brainstem. So, uh, let's try and get the different levels of the brainstem here. So we've talked about the reticular formation. You have one reticular formation that goes throughout all of the different levels of the brainstem. Here we have it up in the midbrain, here. Then in the pontine level, it's here. Then as we go into the medulla, it's in this position here. So we have this reticular formation going throughout the entire length of the brainstem, and it crosses the midline. 
Now, the raphi nuclei are all in the reticular formation and they're all along the middle of the reticular formation, so in the median reticular formation as it's called. So let me just sort of box this portion. This portion here, this is the median reticular formation at the medullary level, so that's the median reticular formation and this is where if there was a raphi nucleus at this level uh, there would be a raphi nucleus so they're dotted along this median portion of the reticular formation so I'll also mark out median reticular formation over here so here is the median reticular formation at the midbrain level and at the pons level here of course is the median reticular formation so throughout the reticular formation throughout the brainstem we can designate this portion that is the medium reticular formation and along that line, in fact I could even, if I was feeling brave, uh, try and draw it in on here. I won't actually draw it in on here, this picture's busy enough already, but this line is representing the medium reticular formation at the back of the brainstem. Along that line you'll have dotted along raphi nuclei, so maybe you'll have one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. So you have loads of these raphi nuclei that are in the medium portion of the reticular formation and again I'll remind you they are collections of cell bodies of neurons that use serotonin as their neurotransmitter and from these nuclei you'll have loads of axons coming out of the different neurons in the nucleus and they'll be sending their axons all over the brain stem. Sorry, not all over the brain stem, all over the brain, everywhere, to give serotonin to all of the brain. Okay, and it performs a modulatory role. Okay, so those are the raphi nuclei and those are the locus ceruleuses where the serotonergic and noradrenergic neurons are located. So, now what we want to talk about is the drugs. How do the drugs actually cause raises in the levels of uh, serotonin and noradrenaline that are being produced? And then what we want to do is actually give out some names, list out some names of these drugs. So these drugs work by inhibiting the reuptake of the neurotransmitters. So let me draw this on. So let's have an axon terminal here. So in this mint green colour, this is representing an axon terminal that's going to release a neurotransmitter when an action potential arrives. So here is an action potential arriving, and then it can release from synaptic vesicles inside this axon terminal a uh, neurotransmitter. And what, depending on whether we're talking about a serotonergic neuron or a noradrenic, noradrenergic neuron, it will release serotonin or noradrenaline. It won't release both of them. If we're talking about a serotonergic one, it will release serotonin. If we're talking about a noradrenergic one, it will release noradrenaline. Now, when it's released the neurotransmitter, it doesn't just leave it there forever and ever and ever. It gradually reuptakes it. And for this purpose, it has a little protein in its surface, a little transporter on its surface membrane, and of course it will have multiple of these, it won't just have one of them, uh, it will have lots of these little transporters on its cell membrane which can pump the, trans the neuro neurotransmitter back into the axon terminal and then it can be repackaged up into axon terminals. It will probably be processed a little bit uh, and then maybe um, repacked up into uh, the synaptic vesicles. Okay, now the drugs are going to work by blocking the reuptake transporters. Now, what are the names for, of the reuptake transporters in serotonergic neurons? They are called the serotonergic reuptake transporter, or the CERT for short. So this stands for serotonin, serotonin, reuptake, and then transporter. Uh, the noradrenaline one is then called the NET, for norepinephrine transporter. That's the uh, thing everyone uses. No one calls it the NAT. We all, uh, with the regards to the name of the transporter, we go for the American name norepinephrine. So this just stands for norepinephrine transporter. Okay, so if we're talking about a serotonergic neuron, it will be releasing serotonin and then it will have the CERT on it to reuptake that. If we're talking about a noradrenergic neuron, it will be releasing noradrenaline and it will have the NET to reuptake that noradrenaline. These drugs, we know that they block these. SSRIs block CERT, SNRIs block CERT and NET, TCAs block CERT and NET. So let me just write that down. So SSRIs are the only ones that are selective for serotonin, uh, hence why they're called the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Okay, now when you inhibit, for instance, let's talk about the SSRIs, when you inhibit the CERT, then 
all of these serotonergic neurons will now be reuptaking less serotonin. They will still reuptake a bit because, of course, you're not going to give these drugs in high enough doses that you block every last uh, serotonin reuptake transporter in the brain. No, there will still be some that are functioning, but you will take out a huge number of them. And therefore, serotonin reuptake will be much slower, and therefore the levels of serotonin will rise in the brain, and that's going to have an effect on the way that neurons are connected to one another. It's going to change the structure of the brain gradually. Uh, equivalently, if we're talking about SNRIs, they will do the same thing for CERT, but they will also now do it for NET as well, the norepinephrine transporter, so they will also raise noradrenaline levels as well. So again, to summarise, SSRIs are going to raise 5-HT serotonin by blocking the serotonin reuptake transporter. SNRIs and TCAs, they're going to raise both 5-hydroxytryptamine and noradrenaline by blocking both the serotonin reuptake transporter and the norepinephrine transporter. Okay, so let's now do some lists. The final bit of the video, which is going to be the boring bit. So, bear with me on this. We're going to list out some of the important examples of SSRIs, the important names of SSRIs. We're going to list out important examples of the SNRIs and the tricyclic antidepressants. So, SSRIs first. So, I'll remind you, this stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. Okay, so... The examples, some very famous drugs in here. We'll start off with the most famous one, which is fluoxetine. Now, you might think, well, is that famous? Uh, yes, it is. Fluoxetine is the official name, the proper name for a drug that is more famous for its brand's name, which is Prozac. So Prozac is a brand name. It was a name that um, the company that probably first created it came up with for it. But then it had a general name that all the other generic companies that are going to make this drug can call it, which is fluoxetine. So the drug Prozac, obviously a very, very famous SSRI. It's one that I think is most famous because uh, it's the one that is generally prescribed to teenagers if they're suffering from mental health illnesses. And the reason it's generally only prescribed to teenagers, I mean, it's not exclusively prescribed to teenagers, but the general reason that you won't see other people on it is that it interacts with a lot of other drugs. So really, to take this drug, you need to be taking very few other medications. And uh, teenagers are generally not taking that many medications, and therefore they can be put on uh, fluoxetine, whereas elderly people, uh, they might be on loads of medications that could react with fluoxetine, and therefore it's unlikely that this one would be prescribed for them. Uh, so I think that's probably the reason that it's so famous, because it is the one that is generally prescribed to teenagers if they're suffering from mental health illnesses. Okay, other examples of SSRIs. Um, Sertraline is another example of an SSRI. Citalopram is another example. So where should I list these? I'll put another one over here. So sertraline, citalopram, and these are all used. These are all very important drugs to know about. So fluoxetine, Prozac, uh, sertraline and citalopram. Two more, peroxetine. A little bit rarer to see that one prescribed, but it is still used. And another one, escitalopram. So s Citalopram. Okay, so those are the five notable SSRIs, fluoxetine, sertraline, citalopram, peroxetine, and escitalopram. And these all work by inhibiting the serotonin reuptake transporter. They don't inhibit the norepinephrine transporter strongly. Uh, therefore, they block the reuptake of 5-hydroxytryptamine. 5-hydroxytryptamine levels therefore go up in the brain, and after a few weeks to months, that will trigger changes in the structure of the brain, making you happier, making you less anxious and less emotionally stressed, and hopefully that will reduce the frequency of your tension type headaches. Okay, next category of drugs. Let's now do SNRIs, and thankfully I've got less to list here. So these are drugs that inhibit both the uh, serotonin reuptake transporter and the norepinephrine transporter, and which are not tricyclic antidepressants. You might say, well, why aren't all the tricyclic antidepressants in this category? Because they inhibit both the serotonin reuptake transporter and the norepinephrine transporter. To be a tricyclic antidepressant, these are old antidepressants. They all have the same basic structure, which includes a tricyclic structure. Okay, so they are chemically defined, that group. You have to have a certain chemical structure to be elite enough to be in that group. 
uh, whereas this is just the group of other drugs that also block serotonin reuptake transporters and norepinephrine transporters that don't have the chemical structure needed to be counted as a tricyclic antidepressant. Okay, so uh, what are the important examples in this category of drugs? Uh, the two important examples are then the vaccine, a commonly prescribed drug, I've seen that prescribed many, many times, and duloxetine. Duloxetine. These are usually reserved as second-line cases uh, when you're treating mental health illnesses such as depression or anxiety disorders or indeed if we're treating uh, chronic tension type headaches. The one that you would probably go for first is an SSRI because they are generally very well tolerated. They are like paracetamol, not quite as well tolerated as paracetamol but they generally will not have that many side effects on you. Uh, so they're the nice as ones to start off with. These are generally more second line. If the SSRI isn't working, then we can move up to an SNRI. And then above the SNRIs, there's then the tricyclic antidepressants. These are more rare to see prescribed uh, for uh, mental health illnesses nowadays because they have a quite bad um, threshold for overdose. So when you're treating depression, of course, there is a risk that people will commit suicide. Uh, so you don't want to give them a drug that's too easy to overdose on. And unfortunately, tricyclic antidepressants are quite easy to overdose on. If you take not too many more of the pills than you're supposed to, they will actually kill you rather than just making you happier, hopefully. Uh, so that's why tricyclic antidepressants aren't generally used for depression anymore. Um, but they can still be prescribed as prophylactics against chronic tension type headaches. So we'll study them here. So tr TCA stands for tricyclic antidepressants. So I'll just write out the tricyclic bit. So it's spelt like so, tricyclic, and then the A is just for antidepressants. Okay, so let's list out these drugs. These all work by blocking the serotonin reuptake transporter and the norepinephrine transporter. So I think I'm going to try and list out all five of these. So the major one that you must know the name of is amitriptyline. It's the most commonly used one, at least in the UK anyway. Uh, other important ones are nortriptyline, so amitriptyline and nortriptyline, spelt in a similar way. Um, then next up we have imipramine, so imipramine, and then desipramine, and then clomipramine. These are the five. So desipramine, and then finally clomipramine. So those are the three, uh, sorry, the five examples of tricyclic antidepressants amitriptyline, nortriptyline, imipramine, desipramine, clomipramine. They all raise 5 hydroxytryptamine and noradrenaline and uh, over a few weeks to months will alter brain structure and hopefully result in you feeling happier, uh, less anxious and less emotionally stressed. So we give these drugs to people suffering from chronic tension type headaches that are being triggered by uh, emotional stress to reduce how emotionally stressed they are uh, and therefore hopefully reduce the frequency of tension type headaches. And they do work. Okay, so uh, we will have a break here. In the next video, we will move on to another type of headache. We have finished tension type headaches after a whole 11 hours and goodness knows how many hours. Sorry, after a whole 11 videos and um, goodness knows how many hours, we have finished tension type headaches and we will now be moving on to migraine type headaches in the next video.